From the pulpit of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, this is Pathway to Victory with Dr. Robert Jeffress. Hi, I'm Robert Jeffress, and welcome again to Pathway to Victory. Wouldn't it be nice if life had a reset button? A simple way to magically undo your past mistakes. I'm sure we all wished for that at some point in our lives. Well, we can't erase our actions or their consequences, but we can have a second chance. And it all starts with receiving God's forgiveness. My message is titled, Meet the Divine Director, on today's edition of Pathway to Victory. Somewhere in your distant, or perhaps even recent past, is a giant failure. Your failure may involve an opportunity you've squandered. It may be a relationship that has been broken. It may be a terrible moral choice you've made. Perhaps right now you're living with the embarrassment of that mistake of yours that everyone knows about. Or perhaps that mistake is still hidden from other people's view, at least for now. But in the back of your mind is this foundational question about your failure. Will my failure become the defining moment of my life? A moment that I'll spend the rest of my life paying for? Or is it possible that I can move beyond my failure? When you think about it, there are only really two people that can determine the answer to that question. You and God. But think about this. It also foundationally depends upon God. I mean, after all, if God is our divine director, if he's the one who has created, written, produced, and is now directing every moment of this 70 to 80 year drama we call life on this earth, doesn't he have the final say about if we can move beyond our failure or not? I mean, after all, if he wants to, after our failure, he can bring down the curtain and say, it's over for you. Or he can choose to raise the curtain again and give us a wonderful second act. It really depends upon God. In Romans 8, 31, Paul asks a seminal question. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, the implication is obvious. Having God on our side is like having the biggest kid on the playground as your best friend. I mean, if that's true, it doesn't matter what anybody else on the playground does to you, right? It's the same way with God. If an all-powerful God is on our side, it really doesn't matter what other people think about our failure. But the opposite is also true. If God is against us, what else really matters? I mean, if God is so offended by your mistake and my mistake that he says, you're finished. Well, there is no second chance and second act in life. So the real question is, is God willing to forgive me of my failure? And that's what we're going to talk about today as we meet the divine director of our lives. Now, I want to move beyond the theological to the intensely practical Right now, I want you to picture the biggest failure of your life. I'm not talking about a slip up or a mess up. I'm talking about the mother of all screw ups. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about that past event in your life that if it were projected on this big screen for everybody to see, you would crawl under the pew in embarrassment. Have you got that mistake in mind? Isn't it funny how easy it comes to our mind what that biggest mistake was? So let's ask the question again. Is God willing to forgive me, to let me off the hook for that mistake? Let's listen to what the scripture says. Isaiah 54 verse 8. In an outburst of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Or Jeremiah 31, 34, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more, declares the Lord. Or Joel 2, 13, now return to the Lord your God, 
for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. Or Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. The Bible says God is willing to forgive you and me. Well, what is that meaning? What, what does that mean? What is the meaning of forgiveness? Remember that word forgive literally means to let go of, to surrender. You know, when we are hurt by somebody else, we've got a choice to make. We can hold on to that offense that somebody has committed against us. We can demand our pound of flesh from the other person. Or we can choose to let go of it. And that's what forgiveness is. And the Bible says our ability and willingness to forgive other people is directly related to God's ability and willingness to forgive us. In Ephesians 4.32, Paul said, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. We are to forgive the same way that God has forgiven us. I want you to think about those words for just a moment. Just as God has forgiven us. Do you realize God is willing to release, to let go of, Every lie you've ever told, every impure thought you've ever had, every time you've put your desire above his desire, he is willing and able to let go of those offenses. You say, how is that possible? What is the basis of God's willingness to do that? Well, we find the whole basis of God's forgiveness in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. You know, some people I find, many Christians, are rather nonchalant about God's willingness to forgive us. Oh, God has forgiven me through Jesus. Oh, yawn fest. Big deal. God's forgiven me. God is willing to forgive me. Well, what's the big deal about that? Every day, I forgive other people of what they do against me. I mean, every day, you and I overlook the offenses of other people, don't we? I mean, the fact is, we don't regularly slug our boss when he mistreats us. We don't regularly curse our mate when he or she ignores us. We don't kill our children when they disobey us. We feel like it sometimes, but we don't do it, do we? I mean, after all, we tolerate the sins of other people. What's the big deal about God forgiving us? Well, the simple answer is God is not like us. You see, the fact that we're willing to overlook other people's sins is not a testimony to our godliness. It's a testimony to our ungodliness. The reason we're able to overlook other people's faults is we've got a big enough list of faults in our own lives. And so we regularly don't have any trouble fellowshipping with other people who are sinners just like we are. But the Bible says God is not like us. We all have slipped up. We've all messed up. We've all screwed up. And because of that, we all deserve hell. Now, here's the $64,000 question. How can a holy God who cannot allow sin to go unpunished, how can, can he forgive somebody like you and me? Well, only God could have come up with a solution. And it's found in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You know, Jesus Christ is the only one who could not relate to this sermon series, Second Chance, Second Act. He doesn't need a second chance. He doesn't need a second act in life because he's never slipped up, messed up, or screwed up. He actually lived an absolutely perfect life. And yet in spite of that, he voluntarily chose to come to earth and to suffer on the cross, not just physically, but spiritually. When he hung on the cross, he felt the full blast of God's wrath, his punishment for our sin. He suffered not for his sins, but for our sins. And for that reason, he is able to forgive us of our sins. That is, God took the perfection of Jesus Christ and he credited it to our account. So that when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, God no longer sees our sin. He sees the perfection of his son, Jesus Christ. Author Max Licato illustrates how that happens 
by an experience probably those of us who are parents can relate to. He said one day he was sitting in his office when his bank called him to inform him that his college-age daughter had an overdraft in her checking account. Anybody can identify with that? And so they wanted to know what Max wanted to do about it. And he thought to himself, he said, well, I could suggest that the bank make up the difference. But I didn't think they'd be willing to do that. He then thought about calling his daughter and asking her to take care of it. But then he correctly reasoned, if she had the resources to take care of this, she wouldn't be in this shape to begin with. She was bankrupt, so to speak. But he said it was really easy to take care of that. Even though she had no money in her account, he had plenty of money in his, certainly enough to cover the $25.31 of the overdraft. So he simply made a transfer from his account to his daughter's account. Now, in a very simplistic way, that's what God does for you and me when we trust in Christ as our Savior. The Bible says we're all overdrawn in our spiritual righteousness account. Every time we sin against God, it's like a deduct from our account with God, and we're all in an overdrawn position. That's why the Bible says all of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We are all spiritually bankrupt. That's the bad news. We have no righteousness left in our account. The good news is Jesus has plenty of righteousness in his account. And when you trust in Jesus as your Savior, God simply transfers the righteousness of his Son into your account. So that when God looks at you, he no longer sees your son, your sin. He sees the righteousness of his son. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 means. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, what does that mean for us? The fact that God is willing to forgive us of our sins. In the few minutes that we have left, I want to share with you two practical implications of the forgiveness by our divine director of our lives. Implication number one is this. We are free from God's condemnation. We are free from God's condemnation because Jesus took the penalty of our sin and paid it himself. We never have to worry that sometime in the future, God's going to make us pay up. We never have to worry about that because our sin penalty has already been paid. And that's why Paul said with great confidence in Romans 8, 1, so there is therefore now no condemnation awaiting those who belong to Christ Jesus. Isn't that a great truth? There is no condemnation. There is no wrath. There is no punishment awaiting those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not suggesting that because Christ died for our sins, that erases the temporary consequences of our sin. Forgiven people still have to suffer public humiliation, divorces, even imprisonment at times for the mistakes they've made. Trusting in Christ for forgiveness doesn't erase the temporary consequences of your sin. He said, well, then what use is God's forgiveness if I still have to suffer consequences for my sin? Think about it. 30 years of painful consequences in this life sure beats 30 billion trillion years of suffering in the next life, doesn't it? I mean, that's what the promise is. I keep thinking about King David. We'll talk about his story often in this series because he is the supreme Old Testament example of somebody who had a second chance and second act in life. You know the story? After his one night stand with Bathsheba, because of that sin, he experienced consequences until the day he died. A divided kingdom, a disloyal son, a dead child. Those were all parts of the temporary consequences that he paid for his sin. And yet, was he bitter about that? No. Listen to what he exclaimed in Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. How blessed, how happy is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How happy is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. How could David be so excited about God's forgiveness when he would spend the rest of his life suffering the aftershocks of his failure? 
Because he understood what God's forgiveness meant in his life. There are three words in these two verses that, that explain exactly what God did for David and what God does for you when he forgives you of your sin. Mark down the first word, forgiven. Forgiven. You've heard me say before that this Hebrew word forgiven literally means to separate. To separate. When God forgives you of your sin, he separates you from your sin. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our transgressions from us. You see a great illustration of that truth in the Old Testament day of atonement. Remember that was the highest day on the Jewish calendar. It was when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for the sins of Israel. But before he did that, before he went into the Holy of Holies, he would take a goat. It was called the scapegoat. And he would place his hands over that goat. And he would confess the sins of Israel. And that goat would be sent into the wilderness, never to be seen again. It was God's way of saying, Israel, I am separating you from your sin. That gives that verse a whole new significance. As far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our transgressions from us. That's what David meant when he said, how blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. But there's a second key word here, and that word is covered. God not only separates us from our sin, the Bible says he covers over our sin. You know, frankly, allowing God to cover our sin is much easier and more effective than trying to cover over <clears throat> our sin ourselves. And yet, as impossible as it is for us trying to cover our sin, we always try to do it, don't we? I mean, go back to David. I mean, after he was found out uh, about his sin, or I mean, after he committed his sin with Bathsheba, for the first six months after that sin, he tried to remove the stain of his sin. He tried to cover over it. He didn't allow anybody to talk about it. And uh, he took Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, had him killed on the front lines, thinking he could cover over it and cover it over it. And then came that day when Nathan the prophet confronted him and said, Thou art the man. David tried and tried to cover over his mistakes. He couldn't do it. It's impossible for us to cover over our mistakes as well. We can try and try. We can rationalize. We can excuse. We can engage in a cover-up. It is impossible to cover the stain of our sin. The good news is God can cover it for us. He covers it with the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. David, after trying and trying to remove the stain and not being able to do so, he finally asked God to do that for him. And listen to what he said in Psalm 51, 7. He said, purify me and I shall be clean Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. That's the relief of allowing God to cover your sin. How blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven and is cover, covered. And then notice in verse 2, whose sin the Lord will no longer impute. He does not impute iniquity. What does that mean, impute? That word impute is an accounting term. It means to put on somebody else's account. How grateful we are that God does not credit our sin against us. That is, he doesn't impute it. He doesn't put it on our account. Not only does he not impute or credit us with our spiritual bankruptcy, he gives us the perfect righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why why David said with such excitement, even though I'm suffering right now for my sin, how happy I am because I've been forgiven, separated from my sin. My sin has been removed. The stain of it will never reappear. And not only that, I never have to worry about God crediting my sin to my account. The fact that we have been forgiven by God means, first of all, we are free from God's condemnation. But secondly, it also means we can experience a radical transformation of our lives. Let's face it, if God is simply just willing to forgive us, that's enough. But the good news doesn't stop there. He is actually able to take the worst failures of your life and still use them, not only for your good, but even more importantly, for his glory. 
If you have a hard time believing that, just think about the example of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. You may say, well, maybe God could forgive me, but he could never use me again. I'm on the shelf. I'm beyond use because of the terrible mistakes I've made in the past. I'm just a terrible sinner. God can never use me. Don't, don't think too much of yourself. You're not nearly as good of a sinner as you think you are. You know who gets an A-plus in sinning? The chief sinner of all time, his name was Paul. In fact, in 1 Timothy 1.13, he refers to himself as a blasphemer of God, a persecutor, a violent aggressor. I mean, here was Paul imprisoning, torturing, murdering Christians. And yet when he found Jesus Christ, God not only forgave him, he gave him a great second act in life. Listen to 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 and 16. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he has considered me faithful, putting me to, into service, even though I was a persecutor and blasphemer and violent aggressor. And look at verse 16. And yet for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me is the foremost sinner. Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. You know, but when I was five years old and became a Christian, the worst sins I was guilty of up to that point was stealing other people's crayons and disobeying my parents. That hardly qualified me for chief of sinner category. Now, make no mistake about it. Those infractions, even though they seemed small, they were enough to send me to hell. But I couldn't go around as a five-year-old and say, if God can forgive me, he can forgive anybody. That wasn't the story that I had. But it was Paul's story. Paul said, if God can forgive me, he can forgive anybody. But listen to this. God not only forgave Paul. He used Paul's terrible, horrible sins I doubt anybody here today is guilty of murdering another Christian because of their faith in Christ. I doubt anybody here can be charged with the same sins Paul was charged with. And yet, God changed his designated designation from chief sinner unto chief spokesman for the Christian faith. Now, that is a powerful testimony that God was able to use that mistake, those horrible offenses, and use them to give Paul a platform, a stepping stone to a great, great ministry. You know, it was Gordon MacDonald who said, God seems to enjoy taking failure and squeezing good from it. God's willing to do that. He's willing to take your failure and squeeze good from it. You know, when I think of a modern day example of the Apostle Paul, I think about the late Charles Colson. Remember Charles Colson? During the 1970s, he was the special counsel to Richard Nixon, president of the United States. He was Nixon's hatchet man. He was famous for saying, I would run over my own grandmother to get Richard Nixon reelected as president. That was Charles Colson. And yet, because of his participation in the Watergate cover-up, Charles Colson, one of the highest ranking officials in the Nixon White House, was sentenced to prison. And if you've read his great book, Born Again, you see how God used that terrible situation in his life to bring him to faith in Jesus Christ. And yet, it didn't stop there. God was able to take Colson's first act mistakes and use them for a second act success. Because after he came to faith in Christ, after he served his time in prison, God used that prison experience to give Charles Colson a platform to minister to hundreds of thousands of prisoners around the world through prison fellowship. I remember going with Colson one time to a prison service uh, and seeing just hundreds of prisoners come to faith in Christ. Why was he able to do that? Why was he able to speak to prisoners and minister to them? Because he had been one of them. God used Colson's first act mistakes for a great second act success. Charles Colson explained how his biggest failure played in his most enduring success. He describes a 
service, an Easter service in a well-known prison in which many people came to Christ. And he reflects upon how that was possible. Listen to what he said. My life had been the perfect success story, the great American dream fulfilled. But all at once I realized that it was not my success that God had used to enable me to help those in prison or in hundreds of others just like it. My life of success was not what made this morning, Easter morning, so glorious. All of my achievements meant nothing in God's economy. No, the real legacy of my life was my biggest failure, that I was an ex-convict. My greatest humiliation, being sent to prison, was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. He chose the one experience in which I could not glory for his glory. Isn't that great? God's willing to do the same for you. He is willing to take the greatest humiliation of your life. And not only forgive it, but to use it for the greatest use of your life. And in the weeks to come, we're going to discover the five keys for allowing God to do that, to give us a second chance and a second act. Many of us have at least a few disappointments about our past performance. Just when you think it's time to drop the curtain on your life forever, God is there to restore you with a second act and a second chance. With His help, you can begin again. Well, if God is in control of our lives, does it really matter what we do? I mean, God can't hold us responsible for our sins if it's all a part of His plan, right? Well, that's not quite how it works. And next time, I'm going to share five biblical principles about God's role in your mistakes. Stay tuned for a preview of what's coming up next on Pathway to Victory. Now, if God is in control of everything that happens in the universe, that means he's in control of everything that happens in your life as well. That means your divorce, your affair, your lapse of judgment, your squandered opportunities, your bankruptcy. Do not loosen God's grip on the direction of your life at all. Join us next time for the message, Although the Script's Been Written, you can still improvise here on Pathway to Victory.